Hi, and welcome back to the Thermal Fluids Book Club. And, and this, to me, is an exciting episode. Now, what I'm about to show you is usually reserved for graduate fluid mechanics. Uh, and the reason being is, is that the math you end up having to do in the graduate level is just requires us to, to level up our mathematics, level up power handling, uh, differential equations, vectors, tensors, things like that. But I'll be honest, like when I look through the chapters in regular fluid mechanics or even in thermodynamics, when you're looking at all the conservation of mass, momentum, energy, you know, seeing all of these like vector symbols and divergence and curls, like it, it, it actually is really, really, really um, hard to follow. I'll be honest, uh, especially having after, you know, gone to that graduate level mathematics. And, and so I'm gonna teach it here um, it is in Patent Chapter 3. You, you can find it, I'm sure, in many other places. And, and then we're going to stick to it here in terms of all the rest of my lectures, just because it honestly makes the manipulation of all of this stuff way easier. And again, which is always true of mathematics. Mathematics is just a language. And so if you up your mathematics, then honestly, all of the physics that you're describing, all of the engineering, actually becomes way easier because you're not getting just bogged down in the sort of lower level inefficient mathematics. Uh, and, and you know this, if you take in high school physics, remember you were having to do, remember all, memorize all these equations for you know, distance and with acceleration and initial velocities and all that. And then you eventually got to uh, physics at the university level that was taught based on the fact that you had had calculus. And so like a distance just became an integral of velocity. And so it, there, it's the same sort of thing. All of these simplifications are always true no matter what. And uh, so we're going to go through it here. And honestly, where it starts off with, in this, uh, and it's either called index notation or Einstein notation. Or, like I said, or Einstein notation. Because Einstein that was dealing with, you know, uh, special relativity, general relativity, Right, it was uh, the the math was so so incredible that he's like, you know, I I need to simplify away just for him to, you know, be able to manipulate these equations covering space time, geometry, gravity, and so what we what I'm doing is you'll take a vector, okay, so some vector v, and, and normally we would write that vector as a three component vector and say in Cartesian system this would be velocity in the x direction, velocity in the y direction velocity in z-direction, uh, and then we're going to basically also say that's, that's equivalent to um, that the one direction is x, the two direction is y, and the three direction is z. And so really our indices are going to go from 1, 2, and 3. And so this vector, ultimately we're going to represent this by just u sub i. And anytime you see an index, and, and, and I'll use i's, j's, k's, LMNPs, like anytime you see an index i that's sort of by itself, no other friends, this this is implying a vector, okay? Um, and then you can have tensors or, or a matrix. I'm not, not going to get into the difference between tensors and matrix. That would be next level of math uh, once you're getting into things like uh, general relativity. But a tensor for us is just going to be... Um, We'll keep it as three by, th you know, three by three, based on, you know, we're we're all living in sort of R three here. So this, imagine this is a x x, a x y, a x z, and then a y x, a y y, a y z, and then a z x, a z y, a z z. Now, same sort of thing. We're gonna x is is, is x is x is one, y is two. Z is three. I'm not going to rewrite that, um, but basically, this would look like a i j. And so now there are two free indices here, which is implying implying that this is a a two dimensional matrix or, or a tensor. Okay? And again, i and j are going to run from one to three. And so that's some basic connotation. Um, and then um, there'll be a, be a few things here. I'm going to save on this end before we get into um, kind of some special functions that we'll want. I'll kind of reserve here in a different color. But what this lets us do, and I'll come over here, is things like a dot product. So if I had a vector A and I was dotting it with a vector B, okay? So if we write that out, that would be 
a1, a2, a3, and we're dot plotting it with b1, b2, b3. You, you hopefully all have done this, where this is just a1, b1, plus a2, b2, plus a3, b3. And so the way we will represent this in index notation is simply a, I'll use the j here, a, j, b, j. Now, anytime you see two indices repeated, it is an implied sum. So we'll switch into colors. That's an implied sum of j is equal to 1 to 3. And we'll never write this sum because it's going to just, it'll just kind of stack up. So anytime you see um, an index pair, it would effectively be this. And so you can do, uh, sorry, sum 1 to 3 of a sub i, b sub i, which is equal to what we just what we just did above. Okay, so that becomes really, really, really convenient. Okay, um, we also do cross products. So if you had a cross b, and then going back to your math days, remember you would write this as a determinant, and you would say, um, well, I'll, I'll use the one direction, the two direction three direction, and then a1, a2, a3, b1, b2, b3. And if you remember the rule, then it was like you would do a1, and you would sort of cross out this, and it would be um, sort of the cross multiplication, right? So you would then have a2, b3 minus a3, b2. And then you would, in the, in the two direction, again, you would kind of cross this. And so it would be A3, B1 minus, A3, B1 minus A1, B3. And then in the three hat direction, you would kind of write this and then cross product. So A1, B2 minus A2, B1. Okay. So I'm going to come back here and show you, again, uh, index notation will make this easier. But first, let's come over here in green, and I'm going to define a couple of very useful um, special things for us. The first one is the Kronecker delta. And this is del i j. So uh, I have two frequencies, so this is actually a tensor. Right? Um, but this has a very easy definition, which is basically it's equal to 0 if i is not equal to j, and it's equal to 1 if i is equal to j. And so if I was to draw that, draw that matrix, that's just 1, 1, 1, and then 0 is an off diagonal. So it's, it's the identity matrix. We would, we would define this as the identity matrix. Uh, so we're going to find it useful. The other one is the Levi... Sevita tensor, and this is epsilon i j k. Now, this would be not just a, a matrix, right? This is actually a, a three-dimensional, a cube, if you will. If you're, you're trying to think of this, this would be a cube, which is why the power of this um, becomes obvious, because I, 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 I absolutely can do things like matrix multiplications, like matrices in rows and columns, but how do I manipulate with a cube? And, and in some equations, especially, again, back to Einstein, it, it can get even bigger than this. And so um, this one, though, is a special feature, which it is equal to 1 when the order is um, going up. So this is equal to 1 for... 1, 2, 3, 2, 3, 1, or 3, 1, 2, okay? So 0 otherwise, and then minus 1 when it's reverse. So when it's 3, 2, 1, um, 2, 1, 3, or 1, 3, 2, okay? And then this is otherwise. And so if we come back here to this cross product, what I'm then going to show you, this is going to get a little lower, also right down here, 
the cross product is just epsilon i, j, k, a, j, b, k. So if you go through it, there's in the one direction, this would be, so uh, I have one, two, three. And again, there's, there's an implied sum here over um, all the repeated indices, which is j's and k's. And so in the one direction, I have a two, b, three, but I also have three and two, but three and two is a uh, one, one, three, two is this one right here. It's a minus sign. So minus uh, a three b two in the two direction. So two. I would have three three one. So a three b one minus a one b two, and in the three direction. So three one two a one b two minus a two b one which is literally what you saw above. And so rather than drawing out this thing and doing this sort of graphical based computation, you just write this. Again, there's an implied sum here over J's and K's, and then you just solve this math. So this becomes super, super useful, okay? Um, and then really the, the power of this con continues. And I'm sort of running out of room here. I'll, I'll try to make myself a little kind of uh, area but you can do things like um, uh, full inner product tensors. So we might write this as T as a tensor, double dotted with S, but this would be just T I J S I J. And uh, again, you have your repeated sums. And so you would do this, right? I, I would go from one to three, J would go from one to three, and you would sum all of this up and it would become a scalar. This is just some scalar P at the end of the day. Um, there are things called dual vectors of a tensor. And so that would be A, epsilon I, J, K of some tensor I, T, I, J. This is called a dual that sometimes you'll find. Um, and then there's a thing called a dyadic product. A dyadic product where you have some, temp some tensor that is formed by a pair of vectors, A, I, B, J. And so there's, there's all this range of things that become um, actually a lot more natural for us to go do. So, so as you're sort of reading chapter three, there's some good examples in there, crank through them. You can find more examples online to kind of, you know, to turn the crank and get used to them. Uh, but this becomes a really, really, really useful, uh, useful thing, okay? Um, and I'm gonna finish here with sort of one, uh, one example. I guess I'll do it down here in the very bottom. Um, save myself room. I'll switch to green so it's, uh, so you can see it. But there is a uh, sort of a mathematical proof that if I have, so if I take the gradient of a scalar, okay, this is going to be a vector, right? So it's the x derivative in the next direction, the y derivative in the y direction, the z derivative in the z direction. But if I take the curl of a scalar, that's equal to zero. Well, it's actually really easy to see that in, in x notation. Why? So curl again, would be epsilon i j k and then um, the curl would then be del j but then I have the gradient of a scalar which is del k of phi and so that's that's the thing and so now let me write what would you see in sort of the one direction okay I'll get a little bit lower in the one direction oh, do that in the one direction, you would have del j del k phi minus del k del j phi. Well, those are derivatives, and the derivatives commute, which means I can switch them back and forth, which is equal to zero. And then you're going to see it's going to repeat the exact same thing on the two line, exact same thing on the three line. And so to prove this is actually super easy in the next notation versus, you know, writing out this matrix and doing all this weird stuff. And so the, the power of index notation is great. And so that's why um, I wanted to get into sort of chapter three of Panton, or it really just, this, this is just the introduction um, of index notation, which is then required on the rest of sort of graduate fluid mechanics when we get there. But I'm gonna come back as we sort of return back into fluid mechanics here 
and use all of this index notation because otherwise it becomes a nightmare of trying to keep like vectors and tensors and, and what's dotted into what, is it a, a column into a vector or a vector into a row vector, all of this just becomes a nightmare to track, whereas under these very easy laws, it becomes good. So, so do the practice on this, uh, stay the course, and we'll see you next time. So again, don't forget to like and subscribe if the book club here you're enjoying. We'll see you next episode.